Welcome to another episode of Startup Health Now, the weekly show celebrating the healthcare transformers and change makers that are reimagining healthcare. My name is Stephen Krein, and on today's episode, we're excited to talk to Manik Bhatt, the CEO of Healthify, a unique startup that is helping Medicare and Medicaid members connect with social services. And what I'm really excited about is that today's episode is part of a program that we're developing in partnership with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to help educate entrepreneurs and innovators about the opportunities in underserved communities. This is going to be a great episode. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy. Best things are the hearts, and all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take it. Who take it. Who take it. Who take it. Welcome back to Startup Health Now. Um, I'm sitting here today with Monique Bott, the CEO of Healthify, and we're going to dig into not only what Healthify does, but how Monique has been incredibly effective at getting grants to help build his startup which is focused on helping underserved communities. Yeah, Welcome absolutely. to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to, to learn more about what you're doing because yeah. um, I'm really fascinated because a startup like yours really probably couldn't have existed even three or five years ago. Um, and today you are really gaining a lot of traction and been around two years, not even two years. Yeah, not even two years, just a little over a year old. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the changes with the ACA, a lot more people are interested in innovation. It's given us a lot of great opportunity to grow. Fantastic. So tell us about Healthify. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start from the beginning. Um, so we're, we're a pretty young group. Uh, as I said, a little over a year old. We got our start in Baltimore doing community health work and, and very light case management work with a group called Health Leads for a number of years. Um, so I was at a pediatric clinic and a mental health clinic. My co-founders were doing community health work, doing door-to-door visits, and was a Spanish to English translator and emergency department, and primarily working with low-income Medicaid and chronic illness patients uh, for these years. And what we saw was that what was really impacting their care and impacting their health outcomes and subsequently driving up a lot of costs to the Johns Hopkins healthcare system that was covering their care were primarily social needs. Uh, issues like food, housing, child care, mental health services, substance abuse services. Uh, but the problem was we saw that there was, it was really tough to manage all of these issues. You know, the pain points we identified were first, screening. No one really knew which uh, member had which need. You know, screening for something like food insecurity happens less than 7% of the time. Um, so there's no so, good problem. So you're separating learning about needs from health care, health or m- medical related issues. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we know for a fact from multiple lines of inquiry that if someone is food insecure, they're five times more likely to be readmitted to the hospital and their outcomes are have a 60 percent chance of being a lot worse. Um, so we know all these things. But again, screening for them is, is very, very low. Second pain point we saw was that even once we identified someone had a concern, Um, getting them to the right social service or behavioral health provider was very, very tough. This information, again, is not in the health records. It's all paper-based, so figuring out there might be a great shelter for someone is very, very tough to do. And then finally uh, was follow-up. Follow-up problems, as you know, Medicaid is expanding. Case managers and other other staff members dealing with these concerns of managing this population are having caseloads that are expanding, 60 to 70 to 80 people. And, And right now, the ratio is one staff member for every 2,400 Medicaid patients. I mean, completely untenable situation, relying only on telephonic outreach. Right, no technology. No technology. So we looked at this and there's, there's got to be a better way to understand these needs that we know are crucial. It's got to be a better way to follow up and refer members to a lot of the services they need to really be healthy and save money to the insurer. And that's why we got started with Healthify. Gotcha. And you say we, I want to know who else is behind Oh, me. yeah, absolutely. So my other co-founder, so as I mentioned, uh, Eric, uh, we call him Chet, it's his nickname. Uh, he was the Spanish to English translator at the emergency department. Um, then I have uh, Dan Levinson, who's our CTO, and Alex Villa, who's our head of product, and, and Jimmy, who's our chief information officer. All of them from Baltimore community. Uh, many of them were doing community health work, and they're a pretty smart group. <laughs> Fantastic. And so you, you, um, you have this idea. Yeah. There must be a better way. Um, how do you get this started and off the ground? Yeah, exactly. It was initially it started off basically, uh, so a little context again, we're completely new. We don't have a lot of credibility in the healthcare space, not a lot of experience building a business or in the healthcare space. 
And when you're doing enterprise sales, one of the two crucial things is relationships, network, and experience, none of which we initially had. Um, so we start off really building our network in Baltimore. We spoke with a lot of physicians, a lot of case managers, really understanding, is this a viable problem to solve and would, be, would someone be willing to purchase the solution? And we had some initial validation, then we built a prototype, initially tested it out, and then we started looking at how can we take this to the next level and, and really sell this thing and, and really grow the business. Um, and we started looking at accelerator programs and completed one here in New York called Blueprint Health, which, mm -hmm. which helped us a lot in expanding the network. Uh, and that's really when we got started and understood um, how to actually scale this thing, how to really build a product more effectively, uh, and really understand what, how roles should be divvied up to grow the company. Gotcha. And so how do you describe today the business and, and specifically the value proposition? Who's your target customer? What yep. value do you create for them? Yeah, yeah. I can, I can talk at length of how we came to a conclusion of the, <laughs> yeah. of the, the customer itself. Because initially we started off selling to something called a patient center medical home, which is a great ACA um, part in the Affordable Care Act, where if a provider group meets these metrics, they actually get more money. So we started selling to these groups, didn't have much success. We had a paper published in the Baltimore Sun and the Medicaid plan in Baltimore reached out to us and said, you guys are building exactly what we need. And that ended up being one of our first clients. Love it. And ever since then, we've refocused and just focused on Medicaid managed care organizations. And that's really our primary customer. And the value proposition they see are really a couple of things. One is efficiency for staff. So right now, it takes right around 45 minutes to an hour and a half for a staff member to find a service that's appropriate for a member. Uh, we cut that down to less than three minutes. So from 45 minutes down to three minutes. Yeah, because okay. we, we build a database, we figure out what's best and connect the dots. Um, so it saves a ton of time for staff. The other benefit is cost reduction. So these Medicaid plans get a set amount of money every month to manage someone's care. Uh, and as I mentioned, a fifth of their spending is going into managing these social and behavioral health needs. We automate a lot of that. We make sure they actually, uh, members get to the appropriate service. And right now we're estimating two to 6% reduction in overall per member per month spending, which actually ends up being quite a bit. Sure. So, uh, two, so you got your, your savings, you got your time efficiency. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So those are the two major things. There are ancillary benefits. Obviously we're giving a lot better care. Uh, these are needs that members self-identify are important in their life. They're more engaged when we talk about these needs. There's a lot of other benefits, but people primarily buy uh, for those other types of things. All right. So you get your first customer. Yeah. Uh, paying customer. Yeah, paying. And you expand from there. So now how many customers do you have? So we have six paying customers right now. And we're, we're actually, these customers were growing internally with them, uh, which is actually really, really great news. Um, we're, so that's been going really, really well. Uh, and we're learning more about how do we best build our product for high engagement in a workflow? Because that's, I think, that some people don't really realize is, yes, the initial hurdle is doing the sale. Uh, getting the contract signed. The next hurdle is actually deploying it and trading effectively. And the next hurdle is maintaining engagement. And you're, you're talking about most technology in the healthcare space, very tough to engage with. So we're really laser focused on how do we get staff to love this product constantly and become internal champions uh, throughout their use. So, so how, how, how does this grow? Look out three years. When, yeah. you, when you look back three years from now and think about what success metrics or what success will look like for you, what, what, do you, yeah. what needs to happen for you to feel happy with your progress? Yeah. So, I mean, as a, as a company in terms of revenue growth, uh, continuing with enterprise sales, there are you know, about 690 of these Medicaid plans. Medicaid is expanding. Uh, our, our pricing model is based on that type of scaling. It's based on a per member per month pricing and how many staff members are using it. Um, so there's a, it's, a, it's a huge market just in Medicaid. Uh, but we're really interested in how do we grow the business exponentially in other markets as well. Um, so not only uh, are, are Medicaid members dealing with these issues, but a lot of duals patients are dealing with these issues Explain too. Explain duals to yeah, so for, yeah, so duals. So it's Medicare and Medicaid. So elderly and low income yep. usually have a lot of concerns, usually dealing with a lot of needs for social services as well. So we hope to go into that marketplace too. Uh, but really, uh, part of our end goal is uh, really looking at the social services industry as a whole. It's a great book called The Healthcare Paradox. And we, we always talk about, oh, healthcare spending in the United States is huge. And a lot of people believe very strongly it's primarily due to the fact that we have an inadequate and under-equipped and under-connected social services sector. So these social services are a mess, too. And we want to make sure that we have the data to connect all the dots uh, and really possibly see what we can do with leveraging that sort of data, knowing what social services are working, what needs are in the population, and what's, uh, who's being engaged or not. Right. So l last question before we move on to some other uh, you know, topics around um, how you funded this, because yeah, it's yeah. really interesting and, and innovative. Um, and uh, it's around the notion of what the alternatives are to you. So what are these organizations doing either today without you, or yeah. is there another company or another activity they're using? And 
what do you think the differentiators are that makes uh, Healthify so unique and so timely? Yeah, absolutely. So th there are a few things. So um, obviously with more providers taking on risk, we're seeing a lot of these managed care plans uh, interacting with provider groups more strongly, which allows them to give a little bit more push into how care is actually delivered. So that's one thing that's influencing us. Uh, but really the, the biggest differentiating factor in how things were previously done and how we're kind of innovating in the space is previously, uh, let me give you a scenario. Um, a patient comes into the clinic and uh, the health insurance plan is uh, basically assigned a case manager to this member. That case manager is relying on usually about a 50 to 30 pages, 30 to 50 page assessment to catalog their needs. Uh, usually this assessment has no social needs in it. It's primarily management of chronic illness. Um, once the assessment is completed, obviously the veracity of this assessment is called into question because who's really gonna be taking this long assessment completely and thoroughly? Uh, figuring out what services are available is, I need to Google it. So they Google it, they try to find out what's available, then they need to track it. Tracking is done on a piece of paper. Uh, so the whole process yeah, is manual. It's all there's, manual. There's no technology alternative right now to you? So there are uh, uh, companies that are building databases of social services. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a huge need. You know, No one really knows what's available. That'll help you guys, right? Yeah, so we, we do that as well. So we build a database, we go into a region, we make sure the information is written at a fourth grade reading level, for example, uh, and, and figure out all the minutia of social service yeah. delivery. Why is that important? I mean, I know why, I want to yeah. tell the listeners why, why that's so important. No, it's huge. I mean, one, one thing that we've quickly realized is there's not a lot of research and a lot, a lot of thought to, uh, given into building digital health solutions for low-income populations. Um, and there are a lot of things you've got to think about. Cultural competency, you've got to think about. You've got to think about uh, readability. So four to six grade reading level is really a must for any patient education material presented to someone. Um, so we have to double check that. And we actually crowdsource some of these descriptions and make sure that at a fourth grade reading level uh, before we upload them into our application. All right, we could have a whole conversation about that. Yeah. But I want to <laughs> turn to um, one of the things that is really important, especially as it relates to opening up everyone's uh, most entrepreneurs and innovators' uh, eyes to the opportunities that lie yep. in helping get uh, companies funded with grants or at least kickstarted with some grant money and some alternative forms of capital. A lot of entrepreneurs think about angel investors and venture capitalists, and one of the most overlooked areas that we see is foundations and yep. organizations that are trying to give grant money to companies that are making an impact and making a difference and aligned with their mission. Can you uh, first of all, set the stage. Healthify has received a few grants. Yeah, three? yeah, yeah. We've received three. We received uh, from the state of Maryland, New York uh, uh, Development Corporation, uh, and Health 2.0 from the Cal uh, sponsored by the California Healthcare Foundation as well. All right. So talk about the three. So yeah. dig in a little bit further. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll break down. So for the first one was uh, from it was a competition in Maryland for high growth companies, and we were just a healthcare company in there, and we really were there other healthcare companies in there. Uh, there were a few other that applied, yeah. Um, so they basically awarded a 100K grant for individuals who would have a, the biggest impact in the state of Maryland in, in terms of job growth and also in terms of actually improving Maryland citizens. Um, so we had a really strong case to say, hey, um, there's a lot of poverty in Maryland. Um, not only building a great business that has a lot of um, gears to grow fast, but we're also building a business that directly helps citizens in Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really, really appealing. Um, then we also won the pilot health tech uh, grant. This actually I want to talk a bit more about this because this is a great. And how big was the Maryland grant? It was 100k. Okay, so it's 100k. So right when we're getting started up, uh, and, and you, that was your first money in, outside of your revenue. Uh, that was your first money in. Or so th we actually uh, we raised our round right before that. So we okay. uh, raised a first seed round, and then we had gotten the uh, the Maryland investment. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. And then right after that, we got the pilot health tech, which is a excellent opportunity uh, where there's grant money given to the startup and the organization that's going to be using the software. Um, so that's right over that money is great. But the, really the huge benefit is a randomized control trial research. And that's really where I think uh, grant money should be every, everyone in the healthcare space should be focused on trying to tap into that potential. Yeah. And, and what I think, because we, we, we worked with uh, New York uh, City and Health2 on this last year, um, but the pilot grant, unlike a lot of other grants, actually not doesn't just give you money, it actually connects you and gives you an opportunity to work with a customer. Exactly. And so talk a little bit about that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, so it's, a, it's basically a client relationship. So our partner was Village Care. And basically how they set it up was, it was kind of a round robin day where you would meet with a lot of potential um, customers. They would say they're interested in working with you and then you would submit this grant application together with very clear metrics of what you want to measure during the next year. 
uh, and really what's the workflow and going in, in really quite detail of what's going on. So we submitted that and then had to present a few times and actually um, actually ended up winning that, that competition and, and getting the grant funding for that and are now starting the RCT trial. We actually launched with them uh, three weeks, two weeks ago. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and then your third one was California Healthcare Foundation. Yeah, so that was a very small grant for a design challenge. Uh, again, going back to the idea that not many people have spent time designing and building really great UI UX for products in the space. User experience. Yeah. Just user to, experience. Yeah. yeah. User interface. Um, that was a grant really focused on, can we build uh, and design a great product for looking at social determinants and social needs very much squarely rooted where we're at. And we ended up applying for that and, and winning that small money. Okay. So what you so see over $300,000 in grants, um, Two very, actually all three, Maryland, New York, and California, very, you know, different missions with all of them. Yeah. Um, what opened your eyes to the opportunity to kind of get grant funding and, and partnerships through that? Yeah, so it was a few things. So I think that uh, everyone in the healthcare space right now, if they're uh, B2B and selling to enterprise customers, this is something I wish I knew when I started, was it takes time. It takes a long time. And no matter how scrappy and frugal you are, uh, you need to be aligning yourself to know that to really scale and, and really grow my business, I need to have research backing me up. I need to have credibility backing me up. And these types of grants are a great opportunity to make that happen. Pilot Health Tech Direct RCT trial related to uh, a metric that's directly related to us growing our business. Um, and the funding is, is crucial for making that happen. So um, as you received the first grant yeah, and yeah. went on to the second, third, did you see the same people applying for the grants, was there any connection back or do you, are you continually see just different people applying for different grants and are you seeing yeah. at the same time, um, any movement towards others really starting to open up, um, and go towards the other grants that are taking place and challenges and other initiatives around the country? Yeah. So what we realize is that healthcare surprisingly is a small world, <laughs> you know, it, it, people are very well networked and, um, we saw the same faces uh, in all of these opportunities really. Um, so that was really, really great because once you build a relationship and follow up with someone, you see them again, it just is that much stronger. Um, so that was really, really helpful for this set. There's another set of grants, uh, that I think entrepreneurs don't know much about because you have to really get in the nitty gritty of what's going on in the academic research world. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, CMMI grants, um, explain that. Yeah. So CMMI grants are from the centers of Medicaid and Medicare services, innovation grants. This is kind of tangential. So if uh, they basically provide a grant to a healthcare organization or provider group in the US to pursue some innovative practice or payment. The thing is, these people who are receiving these grants, these large organizations and integrated delivery networks and provider groups, they need solutions to make sure they hit those metrics. And it's a great way, if you know what metric they need to hit, you know what innovation they're trying to accomplish, you going to the table with them and say, I know you just received a CMMI grant, uh, I can help you directly with what you're trying to innovate in because it's exactly what we're doing. Um, and that's hugely beneficial in starting off the conversation with those groups. And so do you, um, let's talk a little bit about, because uh, we, we want to talk about discovery, but I also want to understand how hard it was yeah. to apply for the grants. Um, how hard was the Maryland one to, you know, how much time did it take and what was kind of the, need, you know, the resource needs to get yeah, those yeah. going? It was, it was, I wouldn't say it's a grueling process, but you got to put in a lot of work. Um, from a Maryland grant, we've also done SBIR, STIR grants, which I can talk about a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, many, many pages, really getting into um, citing everything you say, getting some credibility in terms of references, uh, understanding your research metrics of what you really want to measure from a scientific point of view. And if you don't have that experience, get someone who can help. Uh, and so for the first one, did you do it yourself? Did you do it with your partners? Did you go for outside resources? So for the first one, we actually did it ourselves. Uh, for the second one, Pilot Health Tech, we actually got a consultant to help us and advise us on building and designing the research study to apply for that grant. And we've done the same for the SBIR and STIR, which is another opportunity that every entrepreneur should know about. So Explain those. Yeah, so the Small Business Innovation Research Grants and STIR are Small Technology Innovation Research Grants. Um, so these are from the government, and they're basically for small businesses, for-profit companies, less than 30 to 40 employees that want to pursue something innovative and have a research study to back it. And how it works. And have a research study that they'd like to do. Research yeah, study, yeah. sure. So what you have to do to apply to these is you have to partner with a nonprofit institution. And, you know, hospitals and hospital systems and academic medical centers, perfect opportunity there. So befriend a researcher, befriend an academic physician who's interested in what you're working on and say, would you like to partner on an SBIR grant? 10 to 20 pages you apply. There are multiple deadlines throughout the year, 
but there it can be it range from one hundred fifty thousand dollar grant money to over a million, depending on what phase of company and what type of research. And you've got a doing. couple applications in right now. So we have a couple applications in right now for SBIR and STIR in Chicago and here in New York. So this is both a capitalization strategy as well as a growth strategy because yep. it's not just about the money, yep. obviously. Yep. And in fact, it comes instead of it just coming without a dilutive uh, equity, you know, uh, impact. Uh, it's coming with potential customers, partners, exactly. and data that can oh, help exactly. validate. So ton of reasons why this should be a part of, would you say every entrepreneur who's working in the underserved communities, would you say it's something that every entrepreneur should be thinking about in healthcare? How, yeah. you know, how do you kind of think about who should be thinking about grants as from an entrepreneur standpoint, who should think maybe it's not right for them? How do you kind of? Yeah, I would recommend it to everyone in the healthcare space, uh, but especially for startups that are working with chronic illness, behavioral health conditions, uh, and underserved communities, because the bar for evidence is a little bit higher, I've seen. Um, and, and so getting closer to the point where you can have hard data and strong data to say what you're saying is true, uh, hugely important, especially in those types of spaces. Uh, but generally, I'd recommend it to anyone. And um, are you finding a lot of people coming to you now for help in getting advice on kind of applying for grants yeah and yeah, about grants. yeah and so where, where do you, a what do you tell them and b where do you tell them to go look for grants that might be applicable to their business yeah yeah so i, I definitely recommend um obviously the large foundations keep a close eye on their newsletters and what's going on so there. california healthcare foundation robert, robert Wood johnson Chip. foundation uh pilot health tech uh, exactly. new york city's economic development group absolutely uh you got maryland is still are they doing the grants still? they're doing the grants the medicare well. medicaid yeah any others that come yeah so it, it, depending on what state you're at a lot of states are doing some of these innovation business challenges to improve job growth and, and have spur economic development so that's another great opportunity to keep a close eye there uh, public health departments of your state always have grant money and are always looking for opportunities to help support their work so many states don't have it but you know, a lot of states do and that's another thing to look at um, and then, of course, paying close attention to payment reform and innovation um, grants that are given to the government to a lot of delivery networks across the U.S., something you got to kind of look at as well. Okay. So uh, lots of different places. Yep. Any, any one resource or single resource that has organized them for you, you know, that you kind of point people to? I can't say there's one. I, I'd say, number one, definitely subscribe to as many newsletters as you can. Uh, and, and have <laughs> someone on your team, like Clockwork, Friday morning, look at all of them. Although and make not sure. to your main email address. Yeah, not to your main email address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it really does help. I mean, Kaiser uh, newsletters, Robert Johnson Foundation newsletters, California Healthcare Foundation newsletter, all of these newsletters have opportunities, or at least point to, as I mentioned, these grants to other organizations that you might be able to partner with. And um, the consultants. So I, yep. we, we, there's a lot of different consultants out there. How'd you pick the one that you did choose for the pilot health tech? And then, you know, who do you end up recommending people to kind of look at for help with yeah, their so, grants? So we've had, we've used consultants to help us um, first design research studies and, and really figure out what's going on there. Because even though we had research experience, we're not professionals at all and sure. really didn't know what to do. Uh, and then the, and how, expen how expensive are these consultants? And not too bad, you know, five to 10,000 bucks. Um, and um, so we used, how we found our first consultant to help with the SBIR and SCIR is, uh, we kind of looked and asked around uh, other entrepreneurs in the space and uh, kind of did some research and saw who are some individuals who have uh, gotten SBR grant funding multiple times. Uh, let's reach out to them. Uh, and then, then we got referred to who they got actually help with. And then we actually brought them on board to help us with our SBIR grant. So that's a great strategy. Uh, if anyone needs help, feel free to reach out to me and I, I'll be more than willing to share um, who we've been working with. Um, we also use consultants to help us do research uh, metrics analysis. So one is actually building the study and applying. The second is I need someone to help us actually conduct the study effectively. Uh, and, and we're actually going through that process right now of scouting out individuals. And so this is not just about filling out the applications. You're thinking, uh, being very thoughtful about the data that you're looking to kind yeah. of uh, gather, collect, and, and, and leverage in, in, the, in these. Um, there's lots of byproducts, it seems, yep. from even applying for a grant. What other byproducts have come as a result of the grants that you've received or the grants you're applying for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. So yeah, benefits is, is definitely, money is definitely nice as an early stage company trying to grow. Uh, the research is really powerful, but really the network uh, and, the, and the credibility you're established with academic researchers who, who know their stuff very, very well and share successes or failures with their colleagues. Um, and as I mentioned, healthcare is very, very small. You know, we, we, we talk to physicians here in uh, New York Lagoon, uh, and they know the person we're working with in the Chicago Public Health Department very, very well. And they share stories and they say, hey, Healthify is doing this great stuff. And that, you know, the, the, the potential there is great. 
Excellent. So um, I want to shift gears a bit. First of all, I uh, appreciate uh, you opening up, you know, and kind of sharing both what's worked. Um, and I want to understand what hasn't worked. What, what in this process has been a big learning lesson for you, either that you won't do again or that you'll do differently? Because you've described all these things you've applied for and gotten or that you're applying for. And I just want to understand maybe some of the pitfalls that you've either ran, run into or are running into as you're going through this. In terms of uh, grants or uh, grants? Uh, well, let, let, let's separate. Let's <laughs> yeah, separate because I can talk a long let's time about Let's talk about grants that. first, then we'll move yeah, over yeah, to yeah. back to on your company and, and, and about that. But I want to finish up with grants. Yeah, I think when we're getting started with grants, there are a lot of ones that we didn't win, right? We've been applying nonstop. And that's one thing I highly recommend. It's I wouldn't say it's a numbers game. There's definitely You can definitely prep and prepare and do well. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities out there and you got to just put your foot forward and have templates ready made and, and keep applying as much as you can. I think for us, it was, is really, uh, we did not take the advice I'm saying right now earlier. Uh, we did not think we needed someone to help us structure this research study. We thought we could, we're smart enough. We can get it done. Not true. There's a lot of benefit that comes with someone who's done it multiple times, one SBIR fronting and can help us guide us through the process. So I'd say once you have a little bit of capital to make that happen, I'd say bring someone on board and run through ideas with so them. So it's a good investment. Absolutely. And you tried to do it yourself, like most entrepreneurs do, because they're right. rugged individuals. <laughs> right, right. And you are now leveraging other people's unique abilities around this to help you. Yeah. And so you would have done it earlier, and now you're telling it. others, do it. Do, do it. Okay. Absolutely. Anything else? I think that, that that's really the primary uh, primary thing to get started with, because it... it not only is it uh, less of a time sink, because then you can actually offload to someone else, but it, you'll learn quite a bit more about how you should be positioning your research uh, by getting someone else who's experienced on board. And has there been any downside to getting to getting these grants or applying for these grants? <sighs> Can't say that there has. It's been all really good. Uh, I mean, it's been fun. You know, it's, it's been really, really powerful. Uh, each each grant opportunity and each, especially with Pilot Health Tech, very unique opportunity. You know, Village Care is primarily works with HIV AIDS patients. Um, and that's uh, something that we ha- our product hasn't been built for primarily, but we're learning as much how can we improve the product for that population as well. Um, so that's really, really cool. Fantastic. Okay, so I want to take switch from grants back to your business after yeah, yeah. a few minutes because uh, as we wrap up, um, I'm fascinated. I love um, entrepreneurs doing things for the first time. Um, the mistakes <laughs> they make are different. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, what's interesting is that you're, you're doing all the things that, um, most entrepreneurs hope they can do when they start something from scratch. Um, you've done it very lean, um, and you've done it with, it sounds like a really good dream team of, yeah. of partners that you've kind of built, put around the table. Um, today, what are your biggest challenges to building the business? Yeah, I think our, our biggest challenges right now are, um, one is, uh, in terms of hacking the sales cycle, in a sense. I think for us, even though we have just a few data points, we have a set of uh, paying customers uh, we're never certain how long something is going to take in negotiating and getting something signed and figuring that out and understanding how do we expedite that and how do we learn better and how do we improve our processes around that is something we definitely need to improve because mm-hmm. it makes it a lot tougher. You know, there'll be months where uh, it's very low activity and a month, you know, a big deal will come through. And that's been slightly different, might be the, the status quo in healthcare and enterprise sales, but we're, we're coming from startup culture, right? Uh, young guys interested in startups and, and jumping into healthcare with a specific need because we dealt with that experience. We were not equipped to understand what that really entails. And we were overly optimistic on how fast things would get done. Things move slow. An and, entrepreneur over-optimistic? Yeah, right. Never, never, never. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think that, uh, that, I wouldn't say it hurt us, but it was definitely something we needed to learn mm-hmm. very, very quickly. Um, so I think that's one challenge. Another major challenge is um, understanding um, how to, where do you improve your product and how do you maintain engagement with individuals. Um, so we, we see it all the time. We, we saw recently uh, one very large application got shut down uh, because there was low engagement. Um, and um, we, we see it all the time where people sell the product and then it's not really engaged with consumers or staff themselves. So starting right from the beginning of measuring all metrics related to engagement of your usage of your product is, mm-hmm. is crucial. Don't launch without analytics built in. We launched without analytics, and we have a couple of months where we don't have any data, which would have been hopefully really helpful in terms of um, tweaking so, things. So now you're playing catch up on that. Right. Gotcha. And um, what are you most excited about, about Healthify over the next couple of years or even this year? Yeah, I, I think... We're seeing some really powerful stories with users of the product. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were training people in Florida, um, and a, a, a case manager, uh, a remote case manager, was trying to find a housing service for a patient, transitional housing service for a patient, could not find it. Uh, we trained her, and, and the following day, she found it in less than five minutes, and she let us know. Those types of stories are, are pretty motivating, pretty powerful. Um, so that's 
that's huge. But I think what we're really most excited about is we're collecting really powerful data. Uh, we're looking at what needs are really in a population in the zip code, what social services are being accessed, how are they helping, how does it impact outcomes and claim spending uh, over time. And that, I think, could be very powerful in really looking at where should we be spending our healthcare dollars. Should we be spending it on care delivery or maybe should we be spending it in the community and social service delivery? Uh, and being able to make that claim in a business, I think, is very cool. And are you, um, are you zeroing in, because you mentioned zip code, so it seems yep. like you're in certain uh, regions. Yes, certain you're regions, You're yeah. focusing. Um, and how long will it take you to hit the whole country? I mean, yeah. <laughs> assuming that's your goal. That is our goal. So we, we're currently in New York, Maryland, and Florida. Uh, in Maryland, primarily in Baltimore and Baltimore City. In, in New York, we're primarily in the five boroughs. And in Florida, we're actually relatively throughout Florida. It takes us about a month to a month and a half to build this database of services for a new region. Um, so that's one limiting factor. We're trying to reduce that down. We're actually set to be in five more states by February of next year. Um, so we're actually growing pretty fast. Fantastic. Fantastic. Anything else you'd like to, you know, I always like to ask this, this final question around the notion of um, what would you tell, you know, the entrepreneur who's kind of scratching their head, maybe thinking about quitting their job, starting that company and getting started and has been inspired by your story. Yeah. Stay strong. <laughs> you know, you just got to be very determined, expect very long nights. Um, but if you have a defined plan of what you need to get done and you're passionate about it, um, good things will happen. Fantastic. Appreciate you being yeah, here thanks and, so much. and, and sharing and look forward to, we could do a whole episode just on your company. So <laughs> yeah. appreciate you sharing everything with us. And I um, want to thank you for listening to another episode of Startup Health Now. You can find all Startup Health Now episodes at startuphealth.com slash now and all episodes in our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation series for helping entrepreneurs understand the opportunities in underserved communities at startuphealth.com slash make an impact. Thank you so much for listening and look forward to seeing you next week.